Yes. Oh, they're excited about the beer. Okay, well, we have to thank Dan Sturgis for this beer. He's not here with us this week, but uh, we did want to thank him for paying for it. So if you guys like beer, put your hands together. Ooh. Ooh. I like it. That's him there, right? Yeah. Then this, is, then this is your man right here. This is Dan Sturgis. So he can't be here tonight because he's working with a group of architects to put together a presentation that he'll be giving at the Downtown Speaker Series on Friday, October 4th. Now, Dan is a transportation solutions expert for over two decades. He's been working in that field, and he's worked with a whole bunch of different transportation ecosystem problems. Now, he founded a company called Trans2 in 1997, and they actually designed and commercialized the world's first NEV, which is a neighborhood electric vehicle. So I guess these things are all over the country right now. And uh, Popular Science de designated him as one of the seven visionaries interested in changing the future of, of automotive. So in his speaker series talk that he's doing in October, he's going to present a vision for a way that we can actually convert roughly one-third of all American car owners into these new mobility customers, as well as some of the work that he's doing with uh, Zach Ware and Project 100. So um, I really want to go check out this vision. He said he's also going to be talking about uh, the future of robotic transportation and how in the future we might be living in communities that can remove up to 95% of the pavement and parked cars that we live with today. Oh, that is very impressive. That entire repertoire you guys just said is very impressive. That sounds like a future that I want to live in, particularly in our car culture in Vegas. I'm looking forward yeah. to seeing how he's going to be changing that. Definitely. So again, if you want us to check out Dan's uh, Downtown Speaker Series talk, that's going to be on Friday, October the 4th. Uh, as always, there's going to be a mixer and a free barbecue as well, starting at 3 p.m., so definitely get down there. If you would like to contact him, if you want to know more, I know that I'm in Intrigued. You can contact him at abovecar at gmail.com. He's also on Twitter, so you can contact him on at DNA Sturges. Again, that's at DNA Sturges. Okay. All Sounds right. Well, really thank awesome. you, Dan, wherever you are. Thank you, Dan. To you. <laughs> It's been those new shoes, but we'll talk about those later. Oh, yes, very much so. I can't get over how cute this dog is, by the way. Yeah, we so went in, during the run through, we, went in, we had to get it off the screen because she couldn't squealing. even concentrate. <laughs> so, this is very well placed because we have Kathy Brooks here and she's going to talk about the Hydrant Club, right? The Hydrant Club. So, tell me about what the Hydrant Club is. It is a social club for <laughs> urban canines and their humans that will be at the awesome. corner of 9th and Fremont Streets. We definitely need this. Yes, yeah, it's this is comprised awesome. uh, at first largely of an outdoor off leash place space and we'll be expanding into an indoor play space as Fabulous. well as daycare, boarding, grooming, retail, and possibly wow. veterinary services. Yeah, everything. So. There's going to be some pampered pooches. Lots of pampered pooches and pampered <laughs> okay, pooches okay. peoples. Oh, yes. Yeah, Lots of alliteration <laughs> also, apparently. I evening. love it. I love it. Yeah. So you're going to be opening soon. We'll be opening. Um, we're targeted opening is, is December-ish depends on, on construction, but we started ripping up the asphalt this week, oh, so we're now digging wow. plumbing Congrats. trenches. I stole a piece of asphalt that's sitting on my desk. I'm did pretty you, sure Did you jackhammer really up the first one, ceremonial no, style or that, anything? I got there at 9.30 and they yeah. were halfway done okay. already. I'm like, dude, it's really? You oh, like yeah. This, but, um, I had a yeah, box for the first piece. And yeah, and I actually like went skipping through the dirt in my wellies because I had just come <laughs> to the park, so uh, yes, and there's video of that, but no, I'm not going to share it. Oh, okay. it's a secret. Kind of and I hear that there's like a certain monument being built too, or can you? The world's largest functioning fire Fire hydrant will be on the corner of 9th and Fremont. It will be 14 feet no, tall. No, I didn't see that in the notes. Yeah, Where'd that come from? Bright, bright yellow. Really? Uh, yes. It's uh, the largest fire hydrant in the world, in case you were wondering, is wow. 37 feet tall. Okay. But it doesn't function. It's just an art piece. So this is special. So this is special. It actually, feet? it will have uh, hand pumps and levers and things to actually send a spray out of the top and misters from the front and uh, actually a fire department connection so the fire department can actually attach a hose in case a dog spontaneously combusts. That, 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 that could question. happen because yeah. we're in, you know, downtown and the whole fire thing. That right. is downtown. Crazy. So, you know, in case the praying mantis. Well, yeah, the, pray, the, the play, play, uh, flaming praying mantis. But that's, you know, I mean, that's it's like, like a, a block and a half away. But so. nobody put real beer in the world's largest pint glass over there. I just think that's, well, I'm excited to see that. Yeah, so how can people find out more if you go to a website? So uh, you're looking at the website right here, okay, hydrantclub.com. Uh, we're also on Twitter at Hydrant Club. And uh, if you are a downtown resident and are interested in an open house, I'm doing one here at the Ogden on the 29th. 
of this month, so that's a Sunday afternoon. Yes, whatever football game is on, I will have it on at the time. Okay. Uh, so from three <laughs> to six in the afternoon, very important, very important. Uh, just to find out about membership fees and, and what it takes to actually become a member of the park. Excellent. Well, thanks, Kathy. Absolutely. Excited yeah, thank you very much. Yeah, I'm really looking forward to it. Cool. Thanks. All right, so we're going to move the conversation over to Frederick. So you've got MoveLine, brand new company, and you've came to the VTS. And we want to celebrate today by <laughs> giving you this bottle of champagne to start awesome. with. So go ahead and crack that open. Everybody and then, uh, while you're. <laughs> and then once you get that pumped up, we'll. Oh. Yeah. Before. Might have done that a couple of times. Okay, so while she's, while she's pouring that up, give us the 60-second uh, pitch. Tell us what MoveLine is and what we can expect. Yeah, sure. So for people who are moving, we have an app where they take a video of the stuff in their place and get guaranteed quotes from top moving companies. Okay. So instead of having to call around or if you're moving long distance, you might want to compare truck rental to freight to containers like pods to full service. So instead of getting on the phone and researching all these options and talking to all these salespeople, you just do this video either yourself or over FaceTime or Skype or Google Hangout with one of our move captains, get guaranteed pricing for a range of options. Gotcha. Okay, so you don't have to call your cousin anymore, huh? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Now we've got the new system. All right, and so where are you guys at with uh, as far as like traction and growth and what you're expecting to bring out? How many people are coming out here? Yeah, so um, we founded the company about a year and a half ago, and in March we launched nationally, March of this year. Um, so today we're about 18 people. Um, we relocated 10 of them to Las Vegas here, and since we've been here uh, the last few weeks, we've made three local hires, and we've got a dozen open positions right now, so we're growing pretty quickly. Okay, so we had uh, Emily Wilson came in today to take some photos, and she says she may be one of your first clients, if not the first. Yeah, definitely. We but moved her and her family, um, uh, several members of her family, from New York to Las Vegas. Yeah. Um, so we definitely talked to them a lot about their move to Las Vegas. This is while we were still in New York. Um, as we were, you know, considering what we were going to do with our company. But yeah, they had an cool. awesome experience with us. Yeah, they did have an awesome experience. She said that. So we have a ribbon for you to cut, but first we want to do a cheers and welcome you in. Thank you. Oh, very oh much. I missed it. Cheers. You make sure My arms are cheers. Long yeah. but cheers right. to you. Good thing. Bad luck. I guess to us, so I just want to say a quick thank you for that too. Nice. Yeah, definitely. We write a lot of JavaScript, uh -huh. so um, yeah, we're, we're, we'll, you'll see us around a lot in that community. <laughs> <laughs> That's good. Thank you. Uh, we got a ribbon here for you, Kat. Let's do the ribbon. Uh, Look at the size so of we'll those scissors. Here. <laughs> yeah, these things are dangerous. Don't run so. with them. Oh, okay. Okay. All right. I need a haircut. You ready? Yep. Okay. We'll put it in three, Pitch you up. two, one. Yeah. <laughs> Is watching public warming. Oh, yeah, you miss, you miss a lot. You're at home, <laughs> you viewers. guys have to come down and see this. Okay. For this week's <laughs> events, we're going to be them. focusing on looking and feeling good in downtown Las Vegas. It is actually Stitch Factory Fashion Week, like it always is every month on the third week. And uh, just mentioning fashion, I am actually dressed by Jessica West tonight. Ooh. In the yeah, class. Jessica West. So definitely check out her stuff on Etsy. It's both the dress and the collar. Very cool. And the third annual blowout breast cancer event is happening, um, and it's a silent auction as well, on the 5th of October at Square Salon. Now, I'm a bit of a loyal fan of Square Salon. I've been going there for two and a half years, so I can tell you it's a very good salon. Just wanted to give a quick shout out to my hairstylist, Bree. She's amazing. She's a magician Ooh. with my hair. <laughs> so if you wanted to donate to charity, but also look and feel really good, you can get down there again on the 5th of October at Saturday. The blowout start at 2 p.m. and the party, if you're just interested in partying instead, starts at 7 p.m. And again, that's a square color salon and that's, if you're not sure where that is, that's in Summerlin at Fort Apache Road and that's for a really, really good um, charity. It's for Smiles for Survivors, which is a non-profit foundation and what they do is they provide necessary dental care to breast cancer patients and survivors. So it's a really, really good cause. Um, particularly when you're suffering through something like that, it really helps you feel a lot better about yourself. Yeah. So definitely get down to that. Uh, you can actually get tickets on Ticket Cake too, I forgot to mention that. 
The next event coming up is the Vegan Chef Competition. Now, I don't know about you, Dylan, but if people are competing to win, I kind of want to be eating that food. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> you know you're so, going uh, to win either way. That's... Right, yeah, because you get to actually try it. So on the 10th of October, on a Friday, there's going to be the Vegan Chef Competition, and five of Las Vegas vegan chefs are going to be competing to show off their skills, and your vote is going to help name the Renew Life's Vegan Top Chef. So that sounds like a pretty cool event. It's going to be on the 11th again at the Downtown Farmer's Market on 3rd Street, and it's going to be running from 6 till 9 p.m., so you definitely can get there after work. Part of the proceeds are going to be going to our garden partner, uh, Project Angel Faces, and that's projectangelfaces.wordpress.com if you want to know more about that. And, uh, yeah, I'm pretty excited about it. You can get tickets on Ticket Cake for that as well. Nice. So before we go into this poetry slam, I was wondering if you guys would mind if I'd start with a haiku? I guess. Uh, you guys like haikus? <laughs> would you like to hear one? <laughs> So I found this on the internet. Oh, this is going to be good. Well, it was near and dear to my heart. <laughs> <clears throat> Haikus are easy, but sometimes they don't make sense. Refrigerator. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. I mean, I thought that was killer. I think that you could... Are You Feeling Lucky brought me right to that. I love it. Try I think it. you could actually participate in this. That's yeah. quite some talent there. Good enunciation. So the Vegas Valley Poetry <laughs> Celebration is happening on Saturday, September the 28th. That's going to be uh, in conjunction with the Vegas Valley Book Festival. So definitely come on down. Um, the haikus, as well as um, lots of different other written, spoken, and illustrated words are going to be celebrated. We have some very famous uh, poets coming down. So we have Joan Robinson, Sean Christensen, Vogue Robinson, Harry Fagel, Mick Axelrod, like more and more and more. I don't have enough time to read them all out, but they're fantastic. It's going to be from 7 till 10 p.m., and it's on 401 South 4th Street in Las Vegas. And this is free and open to the public, so everyone loves a free event, and uh, I'm pretty excited. I like poetry a lot, even poetry about refrigerators no, and yeah, haikus beautiful. not making it's sense. It's a beautiful thing. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Dylan. All and right. So raise your hands if you guys think you're better than Tony Shea at poker. Anybody just want to make that claim on camera? Oh, whoa. Somebody dare? Oh. Many, many. OK, that's all right. I they could be. Ready. I don't know. <laughs> we'll let the table decide. So Patrick Martin has actually played poker with Tony Shea, I believe him telling me. He's going to be telling us about our, the charity poker night with Tony Shea on Saturday, the 28th of September. Absolutely. Um, it's going to be benefiting a great cause. All the proceeds are going to be going to the Boys and Girls Downtown Clubhouse. Wow. We're going to try to raise $10,000 that night. Nice. So we're yeah. hoping to get 80 people. There are 50 spots filled up already, so there's still spots available. Great. And additional donations are welcome. Uh, people are welcome to come watch because a uh, portion of the proceeds from liquor sales are also going to go. Oh, nice. Ooh, yeah, so good Gold, Gold Spike's going to be giving some money as well. So it's going to be a great night. Friends, family, just hang out, play some cards, and get a chance to knock out Tony. So uh, <laughs> how did you actually get involved with poker and Tony Shea? That's an interesting story, right? I originally met Tony over a poker game at his house in San Francisco a couple of years ago. I love really? it. That's awesome. How did you end up there? Um, through a friend, mutual friend said, let's go play poker at this guy Tony's house. <laughs> <laughs> Tony the poker player. Like, we all us. know one, but you never know. Yeah, no, and the game itself was a little wild back then because if anybody knows, there's missed deals at home games and... Strip poker? Drinking shots for every random act at the table. No, Needles that's that's crazy. That's crazy. <laughs> <laughs> at least we've evolved past that. <laughs> Ridiculous. <Not> clearly. <laughs> No, um, the night's going to be a great event. It's just a chance to come out, get the community together. Um, we're hoping to have a couple other special guests. Um, top, There is a top prize, or are prizes. Um, first place is two tickets to Life is Beautiful. Oh, great. wow. That's um, very cool. Some other local businesses will be donating as well, and there will be a prize for whoever knocks out Tony. Oh, I really? like this. Really? Yes. Okay, so what's the date again? September 28th, so Saturday, September 28th, starting at 8 o'clock until late. Of course, we don't know how late it's going to go, mm -hmm. but it's just going to be a good time for everyone. Okay. And how can people get tickets for this event? Because there's only 30 left. So Ticketcake.com. Search for poker. It's one of only two events listed. Excellent. Okay. Thank and then, you. Okay, and then if people want to just come drink, though, then they just show just, up just and just show up try and, the booze, right? And, and then that's part, part of that's going to charity, too. So. Absolutely. Part of that's going to charity. There will be representatives from the Boys and Girls Club that's there. So if you want to donate, you can just donate on the spot as well. Okay. I was thinking we could maybe practice if you want. Absolutely. So I, okay. All right. Well, just take that. Cheers. So, <laughs> so to, to the poker tournament. I'm glad it's not me. <laughs> ah, thank you for coming out. I appreciate Thanks it. Excellent. Thanks, Patrick. Thanks.
couple of shoes will do wonders to the audience. All right, so these shoes are designed by my next guest, and these feet that those shoes are attached to were designed by her mother and father. She was raised on a she, I know, I know, I know. She was, she was raised on a sheep farm and a degree in computer animation, a Bachelor of Science in Architecture, and she worked as an architect before founding Mohop in 2005. Now, Mohop is an eco-friendly footwear company that specializes in wood-soled shoes that can be easily created by simply lacing ribbons through them. So please put your hands together for the one and only Annie Mohop. <laughs> All right. Yeah, I miss your hands. So. Okay. So. Thank you. But no, but I mean, but you were in my in my imagination when you fell. You were just fine. It was just funny uh, stuff. Uh, <laughs> it was like a cartoon was a character. Scenario. Yeah. <laughs> Next time I'll jump off and do the split. Yeah. So. Yeah. Impress you. All right, that will impress me. <laughs> okay, so anyways, let's start by talking about uh, your entrepreneurial history. So you have quite the entrepreneurial roller coaster of a story to tell. But uh, why don't we go back to when you were first a kid and you kind of fell in love with clogs and you were just a little little short girl? Yeah, yeah. I think I've I've always been intrigued by wood sold shoes. Um, when I was a kid, I was like by far the smallest person in my class, like really mini person. And this is the early '80s, and clogs became really popular. And uh, my mom let me have a pair of clogs which gave me like two inches <laughs> so, so I could stare at people you know like in their chin instead of their chest you yeah it's it was, it was it was a whole new world so, for you up at that so height. I was like wow so yeah um, that was kind of where it started I've always kind of been intrigued by wood um, for making shoes it's, and they okay. you can make them really comfortable with like ergonomic sole and all that yeah, well, in fact, we've got a, and we have a couple we can bring up, right? So, yeah, yeah. Yeah, because I thought these were just fascinating creation you came up with. So, yeah, so, and the first thing I thought was like, these might be uncomfortable because they're like true, just like standing on wood, but you have just the right amount of padding, right? So, you did, yeah. you've played with this design over and over again, I'm guessing, and. Exactly. Yeah, I have a couple different models, like depending on the, the style of the shoe, there's various thicknesses of padding. But the main idea is that um, wood can be carved. So you can curve them ergonomically, provide arch support, like kind of a cupping at the heel, um, and give them kind of a shape that makes it like a nice rolling motion when you walk, depending on style. So okay. uh, it's been really fun, like engineering the shoe and thinking about like how you walk, you know, and just, I've done a lot of staring at people like walking down the street. Right, and analyzing their <laughs> hip and knee movements. Exactly. Okay, so so we had this clog story when we did our pre-interview, it was kind of a spark point, but there was also a craft fair, I guess, years ago that uh, really kind of started this project. So tell me about how that all went down. Yeah, um, I was working as an architect and it was, okay. It was a lot of like project management. You know when you go to school and it's so fun and you're making models and talking with your fellow students and staying up all night drinking and all right. that, you know, it's a, it was a good time. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, but then when I got to the architecture world, I was still staying up all night, but there wasn't like a lot of fun partying drinking. It was just like project management and getting yelled at by contractors oh, and, and all that unfun stuff. Yeah, the architect Quite is the always change, yeah. like, yeah, the architect is the butt of every like project. Like everything kind of filters through the architect and they're always oh. like wrong. That's why I <laughs> no, made the architect joke. I thought they task. were the kings, you know? I thought we could bring them oh. down a peg. No? no, I'm sorry. The architects oh, are... Oh, so I like yes, kicked on the poor guy. Thankless job. <laughs> thankless job. But uh, yeah, so I was working like crazy and I just really missed doing something with my hand. I, hands. I was working long hours and wanted to do something fun. And so I was thinking, well, well, a friend of mine invited me to do a craft fair with her and I was like, well, you know, what would be so sell so well at craft fair that I could have an excuse to quit my job. And I was thinking, you know, bags, jewelry, clothes, and I was like, shoes, shoes. like shoes. everybody loves shoes, right? So um, I just kind of had this idea of like a skateboard shaped shoe um, inspired and uh, just kind of started prototyping. And I worked for like a year and a half on kind of prototyping those shoes until they got to the point where they were really wearable. I could wear them for like 100 miles, you know. And, and was the craft fair, things. was it right after this point or before it? Well, <laughs> unfortunately, the craft fair happened like six months into the process. So I'm working okay, like, gotcha. like it starts in May 22nd, I think was idea day, 2005. Okay. Yeah, I good. still remember the day. Like I still remember the exact, yeah, yeah, right. yeah. I still remember the exact moment. I worked like seriously like a mad scientist in my basement for six months. Like I'd get home from work at like 8 or 9 p.m. like architects do and worked all night on prototypes and would wear them around the block. I was like, okay, well, they're a little comfortable, but you know, let's make some changes. So I did that for six months and I thought I had the shoes figured out. And then I went to the craft fair and 
there's a line out my tent and everybody was like, oh, shoes, it's amazing. And they bought them. <laughs> and then I came to work on Monday after that to an email box full of, I wore my shoes around the block and they broke. Oh, <laughs> I know. Gotcha. So yeah, so I spent the next year um, figuring out actually how to make the shoes way better. Um, and you know, promised all the customers, I'm sorry, this was, you know, the first round, I swear I will get you shoes that work. And actually that really helped me because I might have even quit after that first round, you know, knowing that they weren't as durable as I hoped. But the fact that like these customers had brought, bought the shoes and I made them a promise that they were going to have shoes of their own. Right. So, so that, I had to like yeah, keep that going, social keep level going. Was over you. Exactly. So I remade all those people some people like five pairs of shoes until I got them right, but I got them right eventually. Yeah, I th- I, well, you know, I mean, everybody says their shoes are super comfy, but we don't believe them here at the podcast <laughs> unless we test them ourselves. So we've actually had our cameraman, Pavel. He's been wearing them for, I believe, all day, right? At least 12, 13 hours, <laughs> right? Now, uh, we wanted to get your honest opinion. Um, and first off, you don't know Annie, right? You're not getting paid. You're not getting paid by her. No. So tell me about your, yeah, arch support, hip movement. What would you say? How would you rate these things? Fant- really comfortable. Um, I've been wearing them with different ribbons and different ribbon configurations all day. They're, oh. <laughs> I approve. I love the way you style them, really. Yes. That no, is it's one for the books. Thank you. This Wonderful. Is I like the way you would style them if you were running around with a camera or something. They're, they're so flexible. Right. <laughs> so thank you. Yeah, okay. That's good. Well, thank you. Bravo. Yes. You. Appreciate it. Okay, well, that's as, honest, that's as honest as opinions get. Okay, so I have a few questions to ask you next, but I, and to determine which one would be best, I thought we'd play this fun drinking game. So go ahead and spin this guy and see what color comes out, and then depending on whether you get Patron or you get Picardi Gold, that will uh, kind of decide the fate of this interview, you could Ooh, say. Oh, it's black. Oh, black. Yeah, that's the unlucky one. Bet on black. <laughs> I'll take one of these yellows with you so we get have an on-camera shot, so go ahead and down that, and then we will uh, see where black takes you. Delicious. All right, so black takes us to... Hmm. So you picked an old dominatrix warehouse for your headquarters. <laughs> so yeah. tell me about your culture. <laughs> Workshop. We are making, you know, wood sold shoes, which can be used as weapons as well. Oh, no, okay. <laughs> I can see it. Yeah, it. I, I didn't purposefully pick out a dominatrix dungeon, actually, but it does have its advantages when, you know, the interns are acting in a wayward manner. Oh. But, <laughs> <laughs> I just don't even know if you're playing along or if you're just like a terrible place to work for interns or what. It's awful. <laughs> okay, well, so, so before you got this place, you, you spent some time in China, and that experience was really something I think a lot of entrepreneurs in the crowd could learn from. So can you talk about what it was like when you tried to get these manufactured in China first? Yeah, well, and I had actually started off for years. I was like, I'm going to make them in the USA. I'm going to do it all myself. And I was just having – it was – just an uphill battle and I was trying to figure out how to do manufacturing in various ways and I just felt like I kept on running into walls and people would be like well, why don't you manufacture in China and I said like, no 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 and actually actually what really happened is a, a copycat popped up and um, they were selling at the same stores that right. were selling my shoes and I wasn't able to keep up with demand with those stores so those stores were taking up the copycat brand oh, and I was really? like oh no 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 you know like I didn't I'll put all these years of to work yeah. to have somebody just come along and take my idea I mean these people didn't just take my footwear designs but they used my website and my photography style and kind of everything oh really yeah okay and um and I, I spoke to my lawyer about it and he's like well fashion industry you know I mean you can either like move onward or upward or you know I mean you can try soothing them but what I suggest is just how to innovate you know, them exactly so I was like okay I'm going to China. And literally, it was a week after I found out about the copycats that I was on the plane to China. Okay. And so, because I had actually already had, um, I had a couple of people there had been contacting me, and I was like, no, 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 no China for me. And then I was just like, okay, China. So, yeah, good, right. yeah so I went there, met with the factory. Um, I mean, I'm glad you went there. I mean, we had Jen on last week, and she did the China thing too for Remotive, and she said, if you don't have people on the floor, you don't even have a hope of getting yeah. something that you actually of quality off the line. So was that your experience? Well, I, quality was still a problem. I okay. mean, I, I did go there. I met with the factory. I went there twice. Um, but I think that they saw that I was a small entrepreneur um, and saw that 
they could take advantage of that situation, honestly. Um, I was a little naive. I thought, you know, here in the US, you tell people your story and they're like, wow, you know, I kind of want to help you. Your story really inspires me. Like, let's work together. But it's it's kind of a different culture in some ways, at really? least in the okay. factories. Right. Um, the factories are really out for, you know, that last dollar. And so they saw me, I think, as somebody a little vulnerable. Um, and uh, they, they gave me great prototypes, but when I got that shipment of a couple thousand pairs of shoes, and I opened it up and I was like, oh, yay, first like big shipment of shoes. I put them on, I walked down the street and I felt this snap and I was like, <gasps> Oh, no. <laughs> oh, yes, these, all these little and, buttons on the side. And, yeah, the little Pulled nails blew little right nails, out. Yeah. And I came back to the shop, and I just started taking shoes, and they were just, like, literally falling apart in my hands. And, and I, this is after the shipment was delivered? Yeah, yeah. So, you, had, so you were in, a, I'm guessing, a room full of boxes? I was in a room full of boxes. And just, like, yanking them, them all up. apart? Yeah, yeah. It was, <laughs> like, just this nightmare scenario of me, like, wailing and pulling apart shoes. And it was much, much drama. But really, it, it really was horrible. It was probably, like, the worst year of my life trying to recover oh, from that. Like, sorry. Yeah, <laughs> yeah that's so bad. <laughs> okay, okay. We don't need the interview to go that far. It's just one black shot. It's not a big deal. <laughs> There's still a blue one left. Um, okay, so well, okay, so from that, though, this is where the story really takes this awesome yeah. upswing, right? So now we can yeah. talk maybe about the future of manufacturing and what uh, manufacturing distribution looks like for a small entrepreneur nowadays. Yeah, I mean, it really kind of made me realize, because I, I had initially had avoided working with China, and it really made me realize, okay, you need to follow your gut. You know, if things are telling you this is the direction you should go in, you know, listen to that. And so... And really, especially that process of remaking the shoes um, really kind of taught me about working more systematically and kind of rebuilding all of those shoes. Because before, I really was working like an artisan, and I was like, let's have some art students in here, and we'll have a fun shoe-making party, you know? And it just wasn't, um, wasn't really scaling right. at that level. Right, so the volume so, up. And exactly. So, so it really kind of got me to buckle down and think seriously about being a manufacturer and what can I do to... Um, to really kind of make a factory that works, like, on a real level. So that's kind of, um, it's been really interesting because what I've really kind of embraced is using technology to create the shoes. So I start with a 3D model of the shoes and render that out, and that actually gets cut out by a CNC machine, which is a, CNC stands for com Computer Numerically Controlled, and um, it's basically a router that uses my 3D model and follows along a series of like X's, Y's, and Z's and kind okay. of carves the shoes out. So now that I'm kind of working in very much like kind of a tech level with the shoes and um, with the 3D models and laser cutting and 3D printing and CNCing and, and kind of all these new technologies, I think that's kind of where the future lies, where I can be competitive with China. I can turn around the shoes so much faster than China ever could. I can interact with my customers and... Right, you just you know, make it change to the file and you just print out the next one exactly. a little bit different. Yeah, okay. Yeah. So I think it's really exciting, the, the future of where this footwear production can go. And knowing that, um, you know, kind of this old school thinking of producing in China really is, like, I can definitively say, no, that's, that's not yeah. working. And well, it's I, not where the future lies. And I know a lot of people around here see a future for this community kind of in this hardware space. So, I mean, mm -hmm. anybody who's thinking about doing something similar or can imagine, a, you know, something else being made out of a block of wood have the option yeah. to, you know, do something. Um, okay, so uh, the last thing I want to talk about, though, is uh, your involvement with a charity in India. Yeah, well, one of the things about my shoes is they do have these interchangeable ties. So the upper ties can actually be made really anywhere in the world. Um, so one, one of my first partners I'm working yes. with is yeah. this uh, co-op in India called Jule, and um, they make ties for the shoes made out of uh, recycled saris. And all the proceeds for the sales of those goes toward a computer lab for girls and women there. So we can kind of gotcha. work on the next generation of tech literate women, get them out of the cycle of poverty in India. You know, now that we're in this kind of tech world, you know, people all over the world can kind of join in and kind of lift themselves out of this cycle of poverty that they've right. been living in. So, yeah, it's really exciting. So that's kind of, I'm, I'm really excited to kind of expand in that realm. I have some partners in Africa that I'm starting to speak with and I'm looking kind of all over the world that people I can work with on the shoes. Um, the great thing is because footwear is so complicated to manufacture and that's why it's just manufactured in a couple little hubs around the world. But since the ties are just really a little textile, people can use their traditional textile making methods, whether it's uh, 
black oh, printing, I guess, yeah. so you can jump into other or industries. weaving, yeah. or you know the saris. Um, so I think it's really interesting way to kind of tie in this made in the USA, but still be able to have kind of an international right. social outre- outreach. Yeah, and just one shoe, and you can reskin it basically every time you go out to match your yeah. outfit. I'm guessing or something, exactly, right? Exactly. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> oh, I'm a fashion guru, but anyway. So um, right now you don't have uh, like right now you're still kind of getting some of this stuff ramped up, but people can follow you. I'm guessing on Twitter is probably the best place to go, which is Mohop Shoes, M O H O P S H O E S, and uh, they can follow you and kind of hear the story as it evolves and when you can maybe push these out to an even bigger production level. Exactly. Yep. Okay. Um, so yeah, we're working on scaling up now. Um, actually, our next level is producing here in Las Vegas. So oh, all right. Really, really excited. I didn't know. Yeah, I wasn't. Yeah. I was hoping you were doing something like that, but I just yeah. wasn't sure. <laughs> I didn't know if Chicago still had you or not, but that's cool. Okay, so you will be producing out here for sure. Or? Yes. Okay, cool. We will cool. be doing producing in Vegas, so we're super, super excited about that. Nice. All right, so everybody, uh, check her out, Mohop Shoes on Twitter, and then Mohop, M-O-H-O-P dot com. So thank you very much for coming thank out, Annie. So I really appreciate it. And give her a big round of applause. Thank you. Here and in the spirit of the poetry celebration we were talking about earlier, I've asked her to prepare a haiku for us. Yeah, haikus are kind of my kryptonite, but uh, I've spent the entire <laughs> podcast creating one about the podcast. <laughs> Excellent, let's hear it. The Downtown Podcast. Free beer, laughs, fun, and events. Vegas Tech, biatch. <laughs> what do you think, guys? Yeah. Like a flashback